If we haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, I know there's a lot of new faces. It's an exciting time at New Life. Um, my name is Nathan, and I serve as teaching pastor here. My wife and I have been around for about nine years now, which is wild. And we find ourselves in the middle of a mini-series on the ordinances of the church. So if you were here last week and we talked about baptism, and hopefully we learned some things as we were worshiping with our kids as a community, just to some of the origin story with that and why we do this ordinance. And the other one that Jesus left for us to really remember was this idea of communion. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but I, I just wanted to give you a heads up that next week we're starting a brand new series. Pastor Ryan Godin is going to be back, and it's called Psalms of Summer. So humidity is here. Why not do a series on it, right? It's going to be awesome. The Psalms of Summer, you're not going to want to miss that. But before we jump into the text, I want to pray as always and just invite Holy Spirit to help us. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege we have to be a part of what you're doing in our city. God, for every woman and man in this room, I know that it is by your divine ordinance that you brought us together, that it's no accident that we're here. And so, Lord, we just, we want to pause and, and say thank you for your presence. Thank you, God, that even when we don't deserve it, uh, as this song said, even when we don't feel it, God, that you're so close, you're nearer than a brother. And, and we just pray, God, as we look into a familiar story, which so many of us have heard um, many times, some of us our whole lives, God, I pray that you would help us in Jesus' name to not just let it come in one ear and out the other, but that it would really grab a hold of our hearts, that it would arrest us, that we would remember the parts of Jesus that we need to remember, that you are our deliverer, our hope. Lord, we need you today. Before we move on, I want to invite you just to pray for yourself. Uh, today we're going to be talking a lot about remembrance, and so just ask Holy Spirit to help you to see him and to remember him and, and to teach you something today. Lastly, I want to invite you to pray for me as best I know how, I want to just submit my agenda to God and ask for his help today. I, I know that he hears your prayer, just as my 13-year-old uh, prayed for me a few minutes ago. It meant so much. And so would you just join me as I surrender? God, I need your help this morning. I know I can't do anything in my own strength that would make an eternal difference. But as women and men humble their hearts, as they open up their minds and spirits to you, Lord, I pray you'd speak through me as only you can do, that you would take my mess, make it into a message, Lord, that you would get the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so glad you guys are here. I'm told by neuroscientists that 2.5 million gigabytes is about the size that our human brains can recollect. Isn't that amazing? This is 5,000 times more than the largest capacity of the latest iPhone. Think about that. 2.5 million gigabytes of data that we can recollect, and somehow I still can't remember my lunch. <laughs> like, it's amazing, like, the amount of conversations and things that I can recall from years and years ago. Unfortunately, especially those hurtful things that were said, my body, soul, and brain has a way of hanging on to some of those things, but yet it's so easy to forget my purpose. It's so easy also to forget where I'm going, not only in my destiny and life, but actually in literal like directions. If you know me very well, this is one of the fatal flaws of my personality is that I cannot remember how to get from anywhere to anywhere else without GPS, right? I'm totally, absolutely dependent on GPS. One of the times it almost cost me everything, it was our first day in India. My wife and I were in Bihar, a, a, an area of 30 million people with no known Protestant church of any denomination. We were so out in the middle of nowhere that you couldn't even wear Western clothes. And our first morning, they had put us across the street at night, and when we woke up to cross the alleyway to get back to where we were going the next morning, we got lost in the middle of Bihar, India, uh, and we were the only white people within, you know, a very, very long time, and we were just looking around, trying to find our way, and so we stopped, and we prayed, and finally we saw the Speed the Light van, like, coming down the way, and they're like, what are you doing way over here? And thank God they found us, because there were no cell phones back then, uh, easily accessible. I remember one time, I was, we were living right off of South Campbell, if you know where that is, and there's a steak and shake there. Less than a half mile away was our home. And although we had lived there for almost two years, I took a wrong turn on the way home. My phone was dead. And by the time I got home, our food was cold. If that tells you anything about my sense of direction. Like, I have this innate ability to remember so much about Marvel and so little about directions, right? It's just amazing how the human, brain, human brains are so hardwired to remember stuff. And yet, like, it seems like the more that we cram into our lives, the harder it is to remember the important stuff, right? And we have super, super computers on our wrists. We have these personalized devices. We can speak with voice commands to call in information at a moment's notice. 
this, and yet it's the most important things that are so difficult to remember. I believe, in line with Psalm 139, that every single person in this room is here on purpose, that God knew every one of us before we were formed in our mother's womb, and that every one of us have a destiny and a purpose, that we were all uniquely, intimately, just woven together very intricately with our own unique design. What other people look at us, and they may see, you know, flaws or differences or think that we're weird or odd or understand the world in a different way, the way that God wired every single one of you in here is with a unique purpose and a destiny to fulfill the Great Commission in your sphere of influence to extend the love of Jesus beyond our own circle into those circles that have not yet heard it before. And I think that reminder and call back to purpose is something that Jesus does in the text that we're going to look at this morning. This idea of an act of remembrance or doing things to call us back to not forget stuff was not a new and novel idea for these Jewish men that we're looking at in Luke 22. During his final night with his closest apprentices and the climactic culmination to his earthly ministry, Jesus called his friends to remember. Can you imagine the weight of this pivotal moment in history just a few hours before Christ is betrayed and crucified? He's calling them to remember, and this act of remembrance that they're in the middle of, this Jewish Passover feast, was not something that was new for the men that he was with. This holiday that was upon them provides context for our text this morning. If you look at Luke 22, verse 7, it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. This is one of the four Jewish festivals that was celebrated in the spring. And this Passover was this ultimate day of remembrance, instituted 3,500 years ago, and still practiced every year by Jews to this day. And the reason they practice it is so that the children of Israel would not forget the miraculous deliverance from the slavery that they were in bondage in Egypt, right? This celebration of Passover was so significant that it required days of preparation and purging where even the leaven or the yeast in their homes were removed. So we see this in the scripture that Again and again, God calls his people to party, right? For weeks at a time throughout the whole year, he asked them to set aside these specific feasts. And if we had time, oh my goodness, you could see ultimate parallels between what is happening. The scripture says on the exact day that the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed is when Jesus sent his disciples to go find an upper room so that they could prepare this Passover, which we're going to learn about today, so that he could institute something we call communion. Now, if you don't recall what Passover means, it goes all the way back to the cross of the Old Testament, right? The story of Exodus is this pivotal, climactic moment in history where everything hinges and it points as a shadow toward the cross and what Jesus would do for us. The children of Israel, if you remember, became a people as Joseph was shown so much favor. Remember, he went through all these highs and lows in Genesis, and then there arose a king that knew not Joseph, and they became slaves, and millions of people were flourishing underneath Egypt's hand and so they turned them into slaves and their cries Exodus says rose up to heaven and God heard their cries and he raised up an unwilling man named Moses right flawed like every one of us and yet somehow in God's sovereignty and patience excuse after excuse he finally gets Moses to surrender to the call and go before the most powerful man in history at that point and he says let my people go and although he performed miracles the scripture says Pharaoh's heart was hard right and he did not want to let them go in fact Moses when he finally surrenders to the call things got harder he said go make your own straw and the children of Israel begin to whine and complain to Moses so much which would definitely be a sign of things to come right they said why are you even trying it was better before you got here but Moses doesn't give up he goes and performs this series of miracles to show that Yahweh the God of Israel is over all of the Egyptian gods starting with the Nile that they would have worshiped we talked about it last week with the word mikvah there in the scripture that these pools of water were transformed into blood and then miracle after miracle after miracle four five six seven eight nine ten plagues come until the final one led to this original origin story of the Passover where Moses, despite warning Pharaoh of what would happen if he did not comply with his request to let the children of Israel go, still had to perform this 10th plague. And so he promised, in line with the miracle that God was showing, that every firstborn in all of Egypt would die if they didn't follow, follow some specific instructions, right? So all of the cattle and all of the humans. And this sounds like such a terrible thing. In fact, it was. It's not 
the direction Moses wanted it to go. But Pharaoh's heart was so hard, it took an incredible plague. And he gave instructions that if you wanted this to pass over your home so that the firstborn in your home did not die, then you would take a very specific lamb of a certain age that was young, that was spotless, and that lamb would become an atonement and purification as a sacrifice to be put over the door so that it would pass over them and that they would not lose their firstborn, right? So, of course, the Egyptians do not follow these instructions given by God. Pharaoh's son is taken, and finally, he gives up and doesn't change his mind for long enough for them to get out of there. And so they're eating this meal of the Passover in haste. And at this exact time in Luke 22, where our text is today, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, They were in the middle of this festival. People are descending upon Jerusalem in this springtime so that they can all remember exactly what happened with the Exodus because parents wanted their children and their children's children to never forget this ultimate act where they were hopeless and helpless. There is nothing that they could have done. And there were all of these amazing symbolic moments that were set up throughout the Passover Seder. And and one of the things that they would do by way of preparation is that they would get rid of all of the leaven in their entire house. So no yeast is allowed. In the scripture, leaven is a picture of sin. And so it was a season of purging and cleansing ourselves before the Lord. So unlike what some of us think of when we think of the idea of communion and not partaking unworthily, maybe like, Jesus, forgive me on the way to get your lunchable communion down the aisle, Jewish women and men would have been preparing for Days and days, not only purging their physical house, but their hearts of any sin. So before you would come to this important moment and festival, if there was anything wrong with an aunt or uncle or sibling or friend, you would make that right, not only on the horizontal level among humans, but also with God. And the way that the children of Israel would purify themselves was only through blood. Leviticus says that the life is in the blood, that it makes atonement for our sin. There's two things that are pictured in the Old Testament that really show the importance of that life in the blood. And if you were to study the Old Covenant, you would see that not only did they sacrifice animals on the altar to purge them of sin because some blood had to be shed in order to pay for the sacrifice, but also in addition to atonement, which paid for the sin, there was also purification. So the priests would take that blood off the altar and they would sprinkle it because sin has consequences not only for ourselves but also for the environment, right? There was a purification that had to happen. So atonement and purification are wrapped up with a spotless lamb looking back over the old covenant and it's rich with purpose and meaning there are a couple of items in this festival that would happen in this multi-hour meal that really have significant consequence for us today as we think about communion. One of them was the bread. Now, because they were doing this as a tradition to remember that night whenever they were called out of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's hand, they had to eat in haste. So to this day, literally Jews are required to cook the bread in 18 minutes or less, right? So this is kind of the tradition that they built. In order to do that with no yeast in the bread, you have to cook it at a really high temperature. And in order to do that so that the bread will be edible, it has to be pierced. I hope you're getting the picture of how this points to what Jesus is setting up for. So this pierced bread that shows stripes is cooked at a high temperature and broken as a part of this celebration. The cup actually was four cups, all pointing back to Exodus chapter 6. There were four I will promises that God made over the children of Israel because they could not deliver themselves. Remember, they were hopeless. They were helpless. They had no power. They had no authority. They were slaves in the middle of Egypt, and their life was getting harder and harder. And in their cries, God heard them and said in Exodus chapter 6, I will deliver you. I will. I will. I will. And so in response to these four promises that come from God to deliver them, They would take four cups, two before the meal and two after the meal. High C juice, I'm sure, right? So you start to see just this symbolism that is so rich and full of meaning. If we had time, we would talk more about the preparation and how this festival lines up perfectly with the one that is coming of first fruits, which is the exact day of the resurrection. But we don't have time, so we'll keep moving into our primary text, Luke chapter 22, verse 14. You can read along with me. It says, and when the hour came... He reclined at the table. Now, my, my firstborn would have done really good in the ancient Near East because you can barely see his eyes at the table. He like sits with half of his body on the floor, just reclining all the time. And we're like, son, sit up right now. You know? But in these days, this is the way that they would do. It was a multi-hour, huge spread of a meal that they would enjoy together. And I love this imagery because life around a table is not just something you know, for the Middle East. This is something that every single culture of the world does, right? 
Uh, there was a birthday party yesterday for one of our friend's kiddos, and there's always sugar and carbs. It's just the way that we celebrate, right? Whenever there's a wedding, when there's a festival, when we have Christmas, when we have Thanksgiving, there are meals we join together and we celebrate. It's like hardwired into who we are as humans that this act of celebration and joy is brought about at the table. Friday night, we had some friends over celebrating some missionaries that were at 100% of their budget, and we took our grape juice and we cheers it, and we were just celebrating bringing in the Sabbath day, and it's hardwired into who we are. I think food is at the right center of all that is right and wrong in the world. I mean, if you think about the problem of food, you can see how it's been abused. I mean, really, even in America, we spend $50 billion a year on dieting, more than we spend on missions. It's amazing when you see all of the problems that come out of the problem of food, not only in our own choices and the health issues, but how the poor are kept from healthy eating um, because of systemic issues. And not only is food at the heart of what is wrong, but it's at the heart of what is right as well. Secular scientists from multiple disciplines will tell you that the height of joy for humans is experience at the table with friends, face to face, looking each other in the eye, enjoying good company and good food. It is at the heart of all that is right and wrong. It's this cataclysmic clash of heaven and earth colliding, right? That food is at this primal center of who we are. If you think about it, all the way back to Genesis 1, that the first great temptation is not the triumvirate of, of money, sex, and power, but it even more primal than that, right? The food that was tempted to be eaten is at that core primal desire of who we are. And Jesus, in the middle of this meal, reclining at the table with his apostles, his closest friends, verse 15, he says to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover. Remember, the Passover was something that they were so familiar with that every year there would have been days of preparation coming together so that they could celebrate and remember that God had brought them out of Egypt. And that Exodus foretelling was just a mere glimpse of what Jesus would do, of course, right? Not only is he delivering us from slavery to Egypt, but he's delivering us from sin and the bondage that we could never have set ourselves free from. In the Old Covenant, they had to purify and atone for sin again and again and again because every single sacrifice only covered up to that moment until the next time. Do you get that? But if you look into the Levitical law and all of the ways that the priests and the temple and the tabernacle were structured, that every sacrifice that was done could only cover past sin up until that moment, and they were only pure until something else happened. Much like the mikvah cleansings that we looked at last week, that the origin story of baptism, that they would do this hundreds of times to purify themselves when they came in contact with anything impure. And yet John the Baptist and Jesus modeled a new way of this once and for all message. When John the Baptist says of Jesus that he is the Lamb of God, think about that. The way that John describes Jesus as he comes to be baptized, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. What would be in the mind of these Jewish people as he says that, other than this Passover lamb that was sacrificed to protect and to deliver and to set them free from what they couldn't have helped themselves with. He says, behold the lamb of God who comes not to just cover up the sin or to let us be free until we mess up again, but to take away the sin of the world once and for all. I mean, this is an ultimate sacrifice that would be done by Jesus, and he's telling them in advance, and they still don't get it. Look at what he says. I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. We know that the reason Jesus came is that he might suffer and die, fulfilling all of the prophecies and promises of God that we could deliver out of not only slavery in Egypt, but out of our sin once and for all. Jesus says, for I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. Remember, there are four of them. And he had given thanks. There's this Hebrew blessing, Baruch Atah. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe, who brings forth grapes from the vine. And he prays this Hebrew prayer. And they sing a song. And he says, take this and divide it among yourselves. Surely that language would have brought them right back to John chapter 6 whenever Jesus fed 5,000 men and more 
And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. And just after this imagery of loading up on carbs, which I love is so biblical, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Like that is so present throughout the scripture. Even after the deliverance from Egypt, there is manna that comes from heaven. I mean, you could just go on and on about how central carbs are to the message of Christ. I love it. And I'm sorry if you're gluten-free. May the Lord bring healing in Jesus' name. <laughs> this pure kind of... Uh, manna bread from heaven that would have been prepared at the Passover is such a picture of what Jesus is doing and you see it in his words here it's it's so moving Luke twenty two nineteen, 19 he says when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you can you imagine these Jewish men who grew up every year of their life since they were young in fact, golly, if we had time, I mean, there's just so many beautiful things. They had three pieces of this matzah unleavened bread that they would put together in something called the unity, and the middle one would be taken out, put in a cloth, and hidden to be later ransomed back by the children. I mean, just rich with meaning at every turn of this festival that they're in the middle of celebrating. This bread that had to be eaten in haste, that had to be cooked at a high temperature so it was pierced. And if you look at a modern piece of matzah, it's striped as well, which fulfills that promise from Isaiah that he would be that he would bear the transgressions upon him, that by his stripes we would be healed. And he takes that matzah bread, that unleavened bread, not having a knife, and it being like a cracker, just similar to what we have here. And he would break it and hand it to them and said, this is my body, calling back to the time in his gospels where he gave this very crazy teaching that if you didn't eat his flesh, that you couldn't be part of the kingdom. He said, it's broken for you knowing what he would have to endure that he didn't want to, but that he was willing to on the cross. And then Jesus says something that I believe is one of the most misquoted passages really in the whole of the red letters. He says, do this in remembrance of me. I want to call you this morning to think about communion bigger than just a cracker and a half ounce of juice. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he's not talking about our lunchable version of communion. I actually think it's even bigger than a meal, though that is part of it. John Mark Comer says, this in remembrance of me is doing life around a table with apprentices of Jesus. And I love this remembrance call because Jesus had not yet been to the cross. So when he's calling his close friends who walked with him through demoniacs that were possessed out of their mind, cutting themselves with stones where chains couldn't hold them, that he set free little children that were dead, that were brought back to life, a woman with an issue of blood that pressed through the crowd and found a healing that she had been longing for for decades. He fed the 5,000, right, and said, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, it's so much more than just a little bit of juice, right? This is a symbol of Jesus calling us to not only remember what he would do in the future on the cross, right? Because he had not yet been, but to remember all of who he is. Jesus is so much more than that. Right? He was present in the beginning in Genesis. We see that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and then God's voice spoke creation into existence. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God and that Word came and pitched His tent among us. He became human to be among us in the incarnation. That is the Trinity fully present in all of history. Jesus is so present and He's calling us to remember Him. Verse 20 Jesus says, and likewise, the cup after they had eaten. It's important that it says after they had eaten because of the four cups that are calling back to Exodus chapter 6, if you go and read it, the third promise of God, it's so powerful. Check, check. Jews to this day call test, it the cup one, of two, redemption. Three, test, one, two, and the third three, cup that would be eaten during okay, the Passover. Checking, okay, I appreciate it. This tradition that's been going for thousands of years by this point grabs that cup. The third cup, the cup of redemption, which points to Exodus 6, 6, which says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Think about that. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Centuries before Jesus would walk on earth, God in his sovereignty would place into the middle of this time of remembrance that Jews still celebrate today, 3,500 years later that God was delivering them 
and redeeming them with an outstretched arm, not only over the Red Sea, but Christ's outstretched arms on the cross for you. The thing that brings me to tears in this passage is that Jesus doesn't just say, this is my body which is given you know, for new life or Springfield or humans, but he says it was given for you. Natalia, it was given for you, Cheryl. It was given for you, James. I remember when communion became personal for me on my chrysalis walk, just weeks after my mom died, and we had our name tags on, and after just this beautiful weekend of just learning about the gospel and unconditional love and just the importance of food in the Bible and how much that has to do with God showing his love to us, I walked to the front and this man who was serving communion said, Nathan, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Jesus shed for you. I don't know if you remember when Mel Gibson's The Passion came out. It was sold out all over the country. And the night I went to see it, although it was the actor Jim Caviezel, his eyes came through that screen, looked into my soul, and it was as if I could see Jesus saying, all this I've done for you. I didn't speak for days after seeing that film. So I was so moved by the sacrifice that Jesus did. When he calls us to remember who he is and what he's done, it's so much more. And it's not just this corporate thing, though that's part of it. It's deeply personal as well. Think about that cup of redemption as Jesus says, this cup that is poured out for you, every one of you, is the new covenant in my blood. This idea of remembering Jesus is not just about the past. Uh, the best example I can think of is like when I'm lost and I need directions and I can't remember which way to go. I'm not just looking back at the past thinking, man, I wish I could remember that. Like which way to turn way back there. But no, I'm trying to take that memory and bring it into the present and actualize it so that I can change the trajectory of where I'm going. Does that make sense? That's what remembrance is. N.T. Wright says it this way. For the hardest thing about the sacraments is they invite us to look at time in a different way. Brother Wright talks about this idea of actualization, that when we partake of communion, that it's not just the past, but it's the present and the future. The author of the scriptures says it this way, for whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Can you see that? The past, the present, and the future, that this once and for all sacrifice that Jesus has made for us is so critical that we not forget it. All of the information our brains are storing, and yet it's so easy to forget our purpose, why we're here, and what Christ has done for us. I know in our culture, as Westerners, that we are hardwired to think mostly about the present and the future, and if I'm not careful, I myself, I will live in the future, because I am an Enneagram 7, and we love to think about all the great things that are to come, right? Right? But in the Middle East, where Jesus was born, where these scriptures were written, the culture is very collectivistic, and it's looking past, and it's thinking more about history as a positive thing. In America, if we say, oh, that's history, that means it means nothing. But in, in an Eastern context, when you say that's history, it means everything. This is why when they introduced themselves, they would say, I'm, I'm John, son of Zechariah, right? That history, context, matters, people, real places, and and for Jews that were looking back, even they had a hard time understanding what Jesus was saying. How much more do we need this reminder of communion to remember past, present, and future? There are five phrases that really point to this idea of communion in the scripture. I want to walk through them quickly as we look at what it is that Jesus is calling us to remember today. The first one is probably the most common one for us in this ordinance, and it is the word communion. This comes from the Greek word koinonia. You can see how they kind of sound the same. It's the same Greek word that we translate for community or fellowship. It's used throughout the New Testament. And so the thing that we remember in the word communion from that word koinonia is two dimensions of the same reality. It's not only communion with God, but it's communion with others. Like that we're called to fellowship, that we're called to community, that it's not something done in isolation, but something that God calls us to do as we commune with him, that we spend time with him. It's not Wendy's drive through or pizza at Bob's house on a Tuesday, right? This is a multiple hour meal and all five of these phrases that I'm sharing with you from the scripture are all actual meals representing time that the body of Christ would give to living life around a table with other apprentices of Jesus. The second one is really the most popular globally and that's the word Eucharist. 
comes from the word Eucharistos, which literally means thanksgiving. It just means giving thanks. So in the scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, we see Paul talking about this, and he says, you know, taking the bread and the cup, giving thanks. So throughout church history, the Eucharist, which sounds like a fancy word, really it just literally means to give thanks this is something that Jesus is calling us to today. And I, I love the idea that gratitude can point us toward happiness. Gratitude also leads to that place where we can experience true joy. Entitlement definitely does the opposite, right? Have you been at a restaurant or a meal with someone where they're entitled to perfection and something is always not right? The service isn't good enough. The food's not prepared perfectly and there's constant entitlement to it being the way that you, right? and we should have good service and good food, but it doesn't bring joy, does it? However, have you been to a dinner with someone who's just so full of gratitude to be there, who's happy to be alive, who's happy to be in company? Perhaps your first meal after quarantine together. I remember the first time we got Mexican food after the restaurants opened back up. I was so grateful for that. I have so many friends that in the last two weeks have just been able to see their parents in their older age for the first time in a year and a half. And that kind of reuniting and joy and that idea of being together is something that was so present in the scripture and this idea of Thanksgiving. So we have communion and the Eucharist. The favorite expression by Luke, who also wrote Acts, is the phrase breaking of bread. And the idea that we're called to remember here is one of sacrifice. Vegan or not, every single one of us when we eat, we're reminded of death. Think about it. All the sustenance that we put into our bodies reminds us that something had to die in order for us to live. Be it a cow or bacon, you know, or a pig, thank you Jesus, or a plant, something has to die for you to be able to live. And that breaking of bread that Jesus modeled that is used as a way of describing the Lord's Supper, breaking bread together, is a reminder of that sacrifice. It's interesting, as you look through Acts, it kind of can be confusing. What does Luke mean by this? In Acts 2, he says they were breaking bread together in each other's homes, and there are many moments where he uses this phrase. And sometimes you're led to wonder, like, is this just fellowship? Is this a meal? Are they hanging out? Or is it communion? And the answer is, of course, yes, it is. Because it wasn't isolated to five minutes, you know, once a quarter, but this was a lifestyle of living around a table in the presence of apprentices of Jesus. That was the phrase Luke used. One that is not used as much anymore, but is written by the author of Jude, is called an agape fest. This unconditional love of God. That kind of feast is calling us to remember celebration. And if you think about what Jesus has done for us that we never could have earned or deserved, Suddenly, you can understand why it should be a celebration and not just a somber, inward-looking, introspective thing. And that's okay. We do need to make sure that we're partaking worthily, that we remember the cross. But the cross is not just some sad thing that happened. It is the moment of celebration that requires nothing of us except to surrender to a God who has already accomplished everything on the cross, right? All of our sin, past, present, and future, has been paid for by Jesus, and that is worthy. So put your tiny little cups in the air, and let's cheers to that, because it is important to surrender in that idea of celebration. The fifth one is the Lord's Supper. You've heard this before, um, really used by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And if you look at this contextually, it may surprise you, but in my opinion, the thing that we're being called to remember here is actually justice that the Lord's Supper is, especially in the early part of church history, an act of social justice. You see, there was such classism and divides. And 1 Corinthians, the most problem-centered book of the New Testament, writes about all these divisions in the church. And Paul, when he starts talking about communion, he says, and I cannot commend you because what you are doing is not even the Lord's Supper. And they're just like so surprised by this. He says, because some of you are hungry and some of you are drunk. Now, just so we're clear, New Life has solved that problem because no one's getting hammered on our, you know, grape juice that's like teeny tiny anymore, right? But think about that excess that in the meals that they were celebrating as the Lord's Supper, that there were people that were getting totally trashed and being so gluttonous, and yet there were the poor who were hungry among them. And this is the opposite of what Jesus modeled in this self-sacrificing, self-giving, agape love that was demonstrated through the act of the Lord's Supper in the beginning where he said, remember me. I eagerly waited to eat this with you before I suffer. And this is not remembering Jesus 
whenever we are neglecting the poor that are among us. So think about all of these things I've shared in communion. We remember the fellowship. We remember communing with each other in the Eucharist, Thanksgiving, and the breaking of bread, sacrifice, in the agape feast celebration, and in the Lord's Supper, social justice in God's eyes. Historically, things moved from a meal to more individualistic test as one, two, churches three, two, one, transitioned out. and we got more practical. And there's a lot of history one, and reasons two, three, for this. Three, two, but one, um, one of the other words that is not in the Bible, but that has been used in church history is the word mass. If you come from a Catholic background, you're familiar with that. And in Latin, the last thing that will be shared at a mass is the phrase, go, you are sent out. And that Latin phrase is where the word mass comes from. Go, you are sent out. So the last idea we're called to remember through church history is not only that the bread is being broken for us, but that it is being broken on behalf of the whole world. If God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, not just so they could be a nation to themselves, but that all nations of the earth might be blessed, how much more is he calling us to break ourselves on behalf of the world? I remember distinctly a communion service at a conference called the World Mission Summit. when I was just 20 years old. 4,000 Chi Alpha students were gathered in this auditorium and it was time for communion. So they passed out the Lunchable version, just like you have. It's very practical. So we're all there and I'm trying to figure out how to get it open. I'd never seen that kind before. And to me, growing up, communion was such a somber, individualistic, like inward focused, serious time that I really, really appreciated and tried to observe so seriously. And so as, as we got to the point where we're about to partake, someone at the front of a room of 4,000 people said, has everyone been served? And as they asked that question, I started to hear a murmuring across the whole auditorium. People like, rah, 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 we haven't seen it. And I'm like, what is going on? Inwardly, I was so surprised because this is such a somber moment. And people are screaming from the corners of the auditorium. I'm like, chill out. We'll get you. The cracker doesn't taste good anyway. Just hang on a minute, right? And, and then suddenly the spotlight from the front of the room spun around to the back. And someone grabbed the microphone and said, I represent the people of Bihar. We're 30 million people have never had a witness of Jesus Christ and we have not been served. And then the lights shifted to the other side of the room where they talked about nations in Africa where people had never experienced an adequate witness of Jesus and they said, we have not been served. And nation after nation, people group after people group for a period of minutes, they represented the thousands of people groups that have not yet been served. And I remember that little communion cup I couldn't even partake. I took it home, put it on my shelf, and let it turn into a science experiment. Um, I'll never forget that. Communion not only calls us inwardly, but it calls us outwardly. For those that have never heard, think about this. How many times have you had the privilege of partaking in the Lord's Supper? And you can do it at home as well. Certainly that's very, even more biblical and historical than what we're doing today. We have this great privilege, and yet there are Billions of people on the planet, billions, that have not had an invitation to come to the Lord's table even one time. And that responsibility is upon each of us as followers of Christ to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, which would include this here. Let's pause and pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to learn more about your table and the responsibility that you've given us to remember. This morning, right in your chair, I just want to ask you a question for yourself. Which part of Jesus do you need to remember today? Perhaps you need to remember the koinonia, the fellowship, the communion with God and with others in real community. It's so critical. For a culture that's so hyper-connected and yet more lonely than ever in our country, many of us need to remember and perhaps even institute a practice of living life around a table with other followers of Jesus. Maybe like the Eucharist, you need to remember to be grateful instead of entitled. Others here, when you, talk, when you hear me talk about Jesus breaking his body and breaking that bread for you, you need to be reminded of sacrifice. For others that have lost the joy of life or of ministry, that unconditional agape love celebration is what you really need from God, and it's okay to ask Him for that. Maybe, like Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, you you need God to bring His justice in your life or those around you. And then I would argue every one of us need to be reminded 
that this supper is not just for us to feel good about ourselves, but it is meant for every people, nation, tribe, and tongue. And may God help us to make disciples who make disciples to every nation of the earth because we're all accountable to that commission that God has given us. Can you imagine new life if every single one of us took time to remember, to commune, to give thanks, to sacrifice, to celebrate, and to break ourselves for the world? As we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning, I invite you to remember all that Jesus is. Thank you for watching us on YouTube today. We hope that the content that you heard helped you know Jesus better. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and to click the bell icon so that you'll get notified every time our channel drops a new video. If you would like to partner with us and what God is doing here at New Life, there are three ways that you can give. You can give by mailing a check to the church. You can give by going to giving.nlspringfield.com or you can text 84321 with the amount that you'd like to give. And if you would like to connect with us in any other way, you can visit us at nlspringfield.com, click on the connect tab, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. See you next week.